Hi, welcome to New Hope Community Church Online. The sermon you are about to hear was originally given by Pastor Chuck Wilson. New Hope Community Church, to know, to live, and to share Jesus Christ. The title for today, though, is Remembering God's Victories in My Life, Joshua chapter 12. Now, the Super Bowl, as you know, is tonight. I'm sure some of you know that. The sea of green out here. Uh, I never thought I'd be cheering for the Eagles. I got to admit that. I never thought it. They've had some frustrating teams. Every once in a while, dip my toe in the water, you know, and then they lose to the Pats that last Super Bowl. And I was so frustrated, you know, a lot of dumb mistakes. And, and their fans are really crazy, you know. It's not just me, the whole country, there's, you know, the Eagles fans are recognized as crazy, you know, throwing snowballs at Santa, that whole thing, right? Um, but, that, but Carson Wentz changed that for me. Uh, he, I heard his testimony, and I loved how he played, and, and Ryan was a big Eagles fan, and he was complaining to all his friends, yeah, my dad's going to love this guy. <laughs> that was his, you know, he was saying to people, and I did. Right away, I loved him, and, and he did too, and we got the bond over the Eagles, which was great. Uh, it turns out there's lots of Christians on the Eagles, uh, and none on the Patriots. I've been saying that, you guys, I've been saying to people, they're like, really? You know, people believe it. You know, that's how crazy you guys are. You know, a lot of people believe that. And I said, I'm sure there's at least one on the Patriots. Uh, but there are, the, the, the Eagles have had this real Christian presence. You know, I, I sent out the article about Foles wanting to be a, a pastor. Yeah, you never know. You know, we put out the invitation. I'm getting ready to retire. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah. By the time he retires, I'll be ready to retire. You never know. We might have Foles as our pastor. So, um, so, uh, so Kim and I have found ourselves pulling for the Eagles, and it's been really strange. Uh, and next Sunday, we will be here either remembering a big victory, all excited, or I'll be preaching to empty seats. You know, everybody's going to be grieving and, and mourning. And, you know, and, and in fact, Kim said, I think a lot of people will be at church today because they'll be afraid to miss because that will affect the Eagles, you know? So, uh, <laughs> We won't have an incentive next week. Uh, it's so fun, when, but there, it's so fun when you win a victory. If, if they win, it's going to be so exciting to be talking about it. Every, it's so fun when you win that big victory, a championship. You stay up late, you know, and you talk about it with everybody, and, and there's a parade, and you watch the highlights over and over, no matter how many, you keep watching the highlights. You buy a DVD of the season, that championship season. It's really, really fun. Now, I know that's hard for you to imagine as Phillies fans, but... Uh, but trust me, it's what happens. I'm a Yankee fan. It happens a lot for me. So anyway, this is what happens. <laughs> Come on, we're, we're, we're bonding here over the Eagles. Let, let baseball go. <laughs> There's a lot of Christians on the Yankees. Sorry, a lot of Christians on the Yankees too. So, uh, But just as we celebrate that big victory, we get to remember it and excited, the same thing spiritually is very, very important that to remember God's victories in our life. And that's what chapter Joshua 12 is all about. What looks like a very boring list really has a very important spiritual purpose. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us all together. And we thank you for your mercy and grace. We ask that you would send your spirit to speak to us through your word as we read it now, to speak to us through your word and Lord, I pray that we would be encouraged and have hope because of this passage. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's pick it up. Joshua 12. I'm going to read the whole chapter. And once again, a lot of times you see these lists and you're like, oh, skim over it. Don't worry about it. You know, there's a reason for every list in the Bible, which we're going to see here in just a minute. List of defeated kings. These are the kings of the land whom the Israelites had defeated and whose territory they took over east of the Jordan from the Arnon Gorge to Mount Hermon, including all the eastern side of the Arabah. Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, he ruled from Aror on the rim of the Arnon Gorge, from the middle of the gorge to the Jabbok River, which is the border of the Ammonites. This included, now remember Ammonites, remember that. This included half of Gilead. He also ruled over the eastern Arabah from the Sea of Kinnereth to the Sea of the Arabah and the Salt Sea, to Beth Jeshemoth, and then southward below the slopes of Pisgah. 
I hope I can get through this. And the territory of Og, king of Bashan, one of the last of the Rephites who reigned in Ashtoreth and Adre, he ruled over Mount Hermon, Selica, and all of Bashan to the border of the people of Geshur and Makkah, and half of Gilead to the border of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the Israelites conquered them, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave their land to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh to be their possessions. These are the kings of the land that Joshua and the Israelites conquered on the west side of the Jordan, from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon to Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir. Their lands Joshua gave as an inheritance to the tribes of Israel according to their tribal divisions, the hill country, the western foothills, the Arabah, the mountain slopes, the desert and the Negev, the lands of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, and Termites. Uh, just seeing if you're paying attention. That's not in the Hebrew, but just checking. Sometimes I've done this and not gotten anything. So, Verse 9, the king of Jericho won, the king of Ai near Bethel won, the king of Jerusalem won, the king of Hebron won, the king of Jarmuth won, the king of Lachish won, the king of Eglon won, the king of Gezir won, the king of Debir won, the king of Gedir won, the king of Hormah won, the king of Arad won, the king of Libna won, the king of Adullam won, the king of Makeda won, the king of Bethel won, the king of Tapua won, the king of Hefer won, the king of Aphek won, the king of Lasharon won, the king of Madon won, the king of Hazor won, the king of Shim. Ron Meron won, the king of Exfa won, the king of Tanakh won, the king of Megiddo won, the king of Kadesh won, the king of Jokneam and Carmel won, the king of Dor and Naphath Dor won, the king of Goyim and Gilgal won, the king of Tirzah won, 31 kings in all. I memorized it, but I was afraid to try it without my Bible open. But. Now, what a list. Easy to overlook, but very, very important here because this is a history lesson for Israel. There is a reason why God put it in the Bible. Anything in the Bible has a very, very important reason. Don't overlook it. It's a very important passage because Joshua is establishing Israel's right to the promised land. Israel's right to the promised land. God gave it to us. We went out and took it, and it, this is not some random Viking violence. This is God's command and plan for Israel. Very, very important. This chapter of God's history is vital to the nation of Israel. They are God's chosen people. They were chosen to be holy, a holy witness to the rest of the world, and they were also chosen to bring the Messiah through them. Very, very important. Now, they haven't always done their job well, and they've gotten into some trouble over time, but that's why they were chosen. In fact, Jephthah used this list in the book of Judges. Jephthah used this very list to defend himself against the hostile king of Ammon. Remember I said pay attention to Ammon? Look at Judges 11. In Judges 11, starting with verse 14, and I'll read it to you. In Judges 11, starting with verse 14, this is the very list. You're going to see the parallels. Je Jephthah used this very list to defend himself against the king of, of Ammon. Verse 14, Jephthah sent messengers back to the Ammonite king. Down to verse 21. Then the, uh, This is him talking, Jephthah. Then the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his men into Israel's hands, and they defeated them. Israel took over all the land of the Amorites who lived in that country, capturing all of it from Arnon to the Jabbok and from the desert to the Jordan. He is repeating. He's using the history here from Joshua chapter 12, verse 23. Now since the Lord, the God of Israel, has driven the Amorites out before his people Israel, what right have you to take it over? Because the Ammonite king was threatening, going to start a war here with Jephthah, right? Um, will you not take what your God Chamash gives you? Likewise, whatever the Lord our God has given us, we will possess. Are you better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quest, quarrel with Israel or fight with them? For 300 years Israel occupied Heshbon, 
Aror, the surrounding settlements, and all the towns along the Arnon. Why didn't you retake them during that time? I have not wronged you, but you are doing me wrong by waging war against me. Let the Lord, the judge, decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. The king of Ammon, however, Ammon, however paid no attention to the message Jephthah sent to him. Verse 32, then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And this was 300 years after, uh, after they took the land. Imagine, that's how old our country, you know, about how old our country is, right? Th that's how long they had already been in possession of it when the Ammonites were, were challenging them. And, he, and he's, his point is that God promised this land to Israel. And, and that's a point to us too. From Genesis through the book of Revelation, we see that God has promised Israel that land. It's promised them. It's given to them by God. Very, very important. And anyone who opposes Israel's right to that land is fighting against God. Fighting against God. Very important to understand. In fact, I'm going to just show you two maps here. I've showed before, but I want to show them again because it really makes the point. The map on the left is what God promised Israel. That's the promised land. And you see the tribal divisions. Look, look how big that is. On the right is the map of what Israel is today. Israel is just the yellow part. The white part is Palestinian territory. You see Jordan, you see Egypt. But that, that is Swiss cheese. That's just a tiny fraction. What Israel possesses today is a small portion of what God has promised them and given them. So anytime you hear people saying, give land back, give this to these people, give this to that, that is, they should not give anything back. That land was promised to them by God. And just as they take, every time there's a war, they take a little more, there's a reason. God is using that. This same battle is going on today. Same exact battle is going on today. The UN is exerting great pressure on Israel, trying to get them to give up the land that God has promised them. This is a spiritual battle. They're, they passed the thing this week saying, you know, business, businesses that are doing business with Israel, are, you know, they're trying to, you know, uh, punish them. It's just craziness. But we know the UN is what it's doing. It's fulfilling prophecy. The whole world is going to turn on Israel. We know that. Many, even, many are, are, are turning on Israel. Even some Christians who don't know the word of God, and I'll tell them that to their face, Christians who don't know the word of God even are opposing Israel's owning and possessing the promised land that God gave them. Many in our country are doing it. And, and it's like Ammon, just like Ammon, the Ammonites were doing, they're trying to is undermine Israel's right to the land. They try to say that Exodus, there's a lot of experts, say that Exodus never happened. There was never a, a, a conquest. There's no such person as King David. Oh, we found the coin. Over and over, the archaeologists are finding stuff. Uh, the, and inscriptions. There never was, they never possessed Jerusalem, which is insanity. Uh, archaeology keeps confirming God's word over and over and over again, but we don't even need it. History, the historical accounts are so clear across the board uh, from all different countries. It, it's, it's confirmation that, that, that God promised this land to Israel. Listen, God's word will be fulfilled. His prophetic plan for Israel will be fulfilled. Just like he gave them the land the first time and he kicked them out because they were disobedient. Warning for us, right? He is promised to recall them to that land. And he's doing that. We're, we, are, we are seeing God's prophecies fulfilled. That He said he would bring them back after their, their time of banishment, after their time of discipline, after that judgment that they had to go through. He would bring them back. And we are seeing that today. It, it's, we, we, those of us... I wasn't there in 1948, but those who were, so those of you who were there in 1948, you saw the beginning of the prophetic fulfillment. But we are seeing it too. It's amazing prophetic fulfillment that we are seeing today. In fact, uh, I'm just going to read you a little, a little bit out of uh, Gary Bauer's End of the Day. Listen to this. Vice President's historic address to the the, the Israeli council uh, this past week, he's talking about it. During his remarks, he was describing Israel's history from the Holy Land to the Holocaust. And he spoke in a Hebrew phrase, and I'm not going to even try to pronounce it. Been out of my, haven't practiced my Hebrew in a long time. Uh, but but it, it, um, 
I'll just give you the English part of it. It says, who has, and Vice President Pence said this, who has kept us alive and sustained us and allowed us to reach this day. Very important. The Israelis watching in their country and Jews around the world heard it loud and clear. That's a, a very important line for them. And, and to, uh, I'm going to read this. In a column today, Wall Street Journal, uh, in a Wall Street Journal column, Rabbi Solovichik points to Pence's speech and he says it was a milestone in American-Israeli relations and a window into the heart of many American Christians who, like Mr. Pence, observe Israel's emerging with wonder and reverence. Rabbi Soloveitchik also says, For many centuries the Jewish people received little love and much hate from the nations of the world, including so-called Christian nations. Today, he didn't say it, I added that. Today, tens of millions of non-Jewish Americans share Mr. Pence's sincere affection for Israel. As the vice president noted, certain predictions, this is a rabbi, certain predictions in Hebrew scripture about the Holy Land have actually come true in the past 70 years. The Jews have returned. Their state has been reformed and the desert is blooming. Yet Isaiah, this is a rabbi talking. Yet Isaiah also predicts that one day multitudes of non-Jews will be moved by devotion to the God who dwells in Jerusalem to shower love upon the people whose capital it has always been. Anti-Semitism is still rampant, of course, and Israel remains surrounded by states seeking its destruction, but the existence of multitudes of Gentiles who are also Zionists has no precedent in the Jewish millennia-long history. This rabbi is talking about us. He's talking about us. And millions of others like us, we are part of God's promised prophetic prediction. We are living it. It's amazing. Amazing. Watch it through spiritual eyes and, and through the, the lens of Scripture. We're seeing prophecies thousands of years old fulfilled right in front of us. It's amazing. Powerful. But there's another reason why these promises are so powerful. And that's because God's promises to Israel are also vital to us as Christians. Because they're parallel to our promises. Remember what we've been talking about in, Is in Joshua here. Israel's physical battle is a picture of our spiritual battle. It's all a picture. It's all a type. It's all prophetic for us. It's our spiritual battle. It's our inheritance. It's our rights spiritually. We're not taking a physical land, but we're fighting for spiritual territory. And that's what it's all about. Israel's right to inheritance. We have a right to inheritance too. Did you know that? We have it. Not to land, but it's spiritual. In fact, in Romans 8, let me just read you a couple verses here. In Romans 8, verse 16 and 17, where he says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are, are we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Indeed, we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his suffering. We are heirs. We have an inherited and incredible Spiritual promises, just like the Israelites in, had the physical promises. Israel was given a land by God. We are also given, they were given a promised land, we are given a promised land too. We are given, we are given a gift too. 
Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. It's a gift. Just as they were given Israel, we have been given the gift of salvation. It's a gift. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, the moment you say, God, I believe Jesus died for my sin, the, the wrong, the, 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 everything wrong I've ever done in my life, I believe that. I want you to forgive me because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. His death for me. His giving his body and blood for me. That's what communion is all about. The moment you do that, you are given a gift. You receive a gift. Just like Israel was given a land, we received the promised gift. And just as their gift was based on Joshua's victories, who's our Joshua? Jesus. Same exact word. One's Hebrew, one's Greek. Same exact word. God saves. We, ours is based on Jesus Christ's victory. In fact, in Colossians 2.15, it says that. It says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That was the victory. Jesus' death on the cross was the victory. Once again, communion. His victory on the cross is what gives us all these rights. It's what gives us life eternal, which starts the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's all based on Jesus Christ, our Joshua's victories. And it's a vital, it's vital to know this. It's vital to know who we are in Christ. What we have in Christ. The promises that we've been given in Christ. I, we have several really good books on the, in the back there. Uh, one is called Victory Over Darkness, which has a great list, Who I Am in Christ. Uh, Search for Significance, another great one. Uh, boy, if, if we can just, you get, get those lists and read those over and over again and look up the verses and meditate on them. It, it, it's huge. This, it's vital that we know who we are in Christ. This list here in Joshua 12 that I read, Starting to look a little more important, isn't it? This list in Joshua chapter 12 was given right after they just had defeated who? The giants. They just had defeated the giants. That was the last big battle. They defeat the giants and then they get this. And that's, that's a picture for us. Right after Jesus Christ defeated our giants. Right after we put our faith in Jesus Christ, who has defeated our giants, we will be challenged. We will be challenged, just, the, just like the Ammonites were challenging. We will be challenged immediately. And it's important to know what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. Very, very important. We will be challenged by the world. We'll be challenged by our, the sinful flesh. We'll be challenged by Satan, who's going to challenge our right to our victories, our spiritual victories that Christ has given us on that cross. The moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to be challenged. I got a great video picture for you. It's pretty hard to watch, but uh, not as bad as some of my farm stories, but it's pretty hard. But we were, I was watching the, the Planet Earth movie with the kids the other day, and, and they showed these baby iguanas coming up out of the ground. They're hatching, out, hatching, coming up out, and as they come out, they're hunted immediately. And it's, a, I think it's a really vivid picture of us. When we put our faith in Christ, we are immediately hunted. And we've got to fight and know, find out who we are and grow immediately and, and take steps to, to reach the summit that, to, for protection. I'll show you the video, then, we'll, then I'll talk some more about it. <coughs> A snake's eyes aren't very good, but they can detect movement. So if the hatchling keeps its nerve, it may just avoid detection. A near miraculous escape. Hopefully Nick Foles can do the same thing today. <laughs> wow. But that, this baby iguana just came up out of the ground. And they all got to run the gauntlet. You know, most, many of them don't make it. That, I think, is just a vivid picture of what we go through as a, a new Christian. We're immediately attacked. 
The, the enemy will try to destroy our faith. He'll try to knock us down. He'll try to stunt our growth. He'll try to neutralize our impact. And it's vital as a brand new Christian to grow in our faith. That's where we need discipleship. That's where we need fellowship. Um, if, you're not, if you haven't been discipled at one-to-one mentoring or a small group, very important, talk to me. We'll get you connected. Lots of people, very, very hard to survive alone. Hard to survive alone. We, we, need, we need each other, right? And as Christians, we must know who we are, what we've been given. We have to get to the top, climb to the top so that we're you know, that strong. They're just like that iguana or the baby iguana. We will continue to face giants in our life. We beat one when we talked about this, killing your giants. We'll continue to face giants in our life. And when we're facing those giants, it's vital. And this is what this is all about. They just got done fighting their giants and they get this list. It's important to remember God's victory. Just like here in Joshua 12. That's what it's all about, remembering God's victories. It's vital when we're facing the king of Ammon. You know, we, we're going to face the Ammonites too. And, 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 but it's not a regular guy. It's, it's Satan, who the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night. He's going to be constantly accusing us. You're no Christian. Look at what you just thought. Look at what you just did. Or he'll plant a thought in our mind and then uh, accuse us for having it when he's the one who planted it, right? And, and he's constantly accusing. But when that happens, we must remember what Christ accomplished on the cross how, and how God has helped us day by day. We have to remember it. We have to remember how, what he accomplished on the cross, how Jesus, defend, how Jesus defended our, defeated our Ogs. Remember here in Joshua 12, the Ogs, the giant. Og was a giant. Uh, we study that whole thing. He was a giant. But at the cross, Jesus defeated our giants by the blood of Jesus Christ, which is communion is all about. He defeated our giant. That we have to remember also as Christians, very, very important, we have to remember how God delivered us from the Sihons. Uh, remember back in Joshua 12 there, the, the Sihons, the king of Sihon, and the 31 kings, are, which are, are a picture of our strongholds. They fell one by one. We have to remember how God helped us break those strongholds down. Strongholds down. And it's important to remember this. It's important to remember this when we're in a new battle. When we're facing a new stronghold, we're facing a new trial in our life. When we're facing that, we have to remember that God has delivered us many times. Many, many times and he's going to deliver us again. 31 times. 31 kings. There's a reason why he listed them all. God's reminding us that he's delivered us. And that's to be our encouragement in the battle. That's to be our encouragement when we're facing temptation. That's to be our encouragement when we're facing a brand new trial. We've been talking about this. Do you have a way to remember? Do you remember God's victories in your life? Do you have a diary or a, a prayer journal? I was reading mine the other day. And I don't know why, I just was looking at some stuff, and it was so encouraging. So many things I had forgotten, and I needed to read it this week. And so many things that I had forgotten, and it was so encouraging. It's easy to forget what God has done. It's easy to forget the cross. It's easy to forget all the things that God has done in my life year after year. It's so easy to forget, especially when we're in the trenches, right? We're fighting in the trenches, especially when we're facing another giant. It's easy to forget. And I was just working on this and, you know, kind of wrestling with this passage and, and this thought. And I got a text from Mel. And uh, Mel, Mel sends me a text. And I'll, and, and I'll let him share it, and share it here in a minute. But I was like, Mel, this is exactly what I'm talking about on Sunday. Could you, you know, share this? And so I'm, I'm going to ask him to share and you'll see why. It's exactly what I was talking about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, but. I want to use the text to stay on point, otherwise we might be here till the Super Bowl. Um, it's a miracle. It's just amazing how it, this happened. And I don't text you that often. No. And I, it's Friday morning, and you're hearing about the Super Bowl and everything. And so I was thinking about, you know, I heard that they were in the Super Bowl, oh, 14 years ago. And at that time, I was oblivious to it. I wasn't following football. I didn't watch that Super Bowl, didn't know anything. And thinking about that to now, um, which, by the way, when there was an Eagles game a couple of years ago when they were playing in the snow, and that game really got me into the football and, and the Eagles and stuff like that, so I'll be watching this Super Bowl. But I was thinking back to 2004 and that time, 
And, and, and the way things were then and the way things are today, and, and what a difference, and, and all that's happened in, from the, in those 14 years. And I wrote this text and sent it to Pastor Chuck and friends, and it was, it's just a, 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 amazing to think about. In 2004, this time in 2004, I was living in Sellers Row. I was coming to this church about a year and a half at that time. I was unemployed. I had no contact with my children, nor any family for that matter. And I was dealing with depression, which I'm typically not a a depressed person. But God was, was using that as a time to get closer to him, to develop the vision for ministry. And Larry was helping me with writing a plan, a business plan and a proposal for a vision for having a a business that would provide um, employment for ex-inmates and and doing Bible studies, writing the curriculum for what is being used now. These things gave me faith to believe that, that God is going to get me through this and the best is yet to come. And, and God did that and, and continues to do that today. And shortly thereafter is when uh, another thing, Gina, um, if some of you may remember her, um, another thing that got me through that time was hanging out with her. We had the singles ministry at the Deep End Cafe and and the encouragement and going with me and when I would share my testimony. And also, she had talked to her father about me helping him move the business, and I did that, and I've been working for him ever since. So it provided the employment just before the and unemployment had ended. And then in that time, I met Ed and Gretchen, and our friendship developed, and the ministry began to grow, and then the victories be just blossomed from then, from um, my children making contact with me and other family me- members making contact, the ministry continuing to grow and, and God just doing amazing things and remembering that uh, was such an encouragement to share and I thank you for letting me share that today. And you know, my friend, I knew him for 25 years, he always said the best is yet to come. And God restored the years the locusts had eaten and blessed me with my family back, my life back. But today, there are still challenges. There are still trials and and things to overcome, visions to be met. And yet, even today, as, as, as blessed as I am, I still say the best is yet to come. Thank you. It's like, God, that that text was, you know, and it's so encouraging. Mel's life and ministry has just been so encouraging. Uh, Awesome, awesome. That's why I love our testimony services. We have our testimony services, and and, and everybody shares. We're not all sharing, oh, everything's perfect. (laughs) Far from it. But But we remember the victories. We remember the answered prayers. We remember the faith history. We remember how we became Christians and when we put our faith in Jesus. And it's what helps us get through the, the, the next giant, next trial or, or face that, that next giant, giant. When we're down, when we're down, we need reminding. Anybody ever down? We need reminding, right? We need reminding of God's faith. We need to remember God's faithfulness as we face temptations and trials we we need to remember and and and, and I remind people all the time uh, I, I always say we're not about perfection we're about progress right but I'm constantly reminding people that listen re, look where you were they get down they're upset they, this happened that happened they're struggling again whatever and I I always say look where you were look where you were a year ago look where you were 14 years ago look where you were that's what you have to look at, not, not what's hitting you right now, but where you've, the, the, what God has done in your life, the victories, the progress, the changes. They're little by little, but, the, but over time, they, they have, each little 
you saw that little iguana, dodge that snake, dodge that one. Every battle takes you to another step higher and another step higher until he's finally at the, the, the top of the mountain there where he's, where he's, he's arrived, you know. And, and that, that's, what, that's where we're headed for, heaven someday, right? And, and, and we, we need that reminding. We need that reminding. Remembering God's victories in my life. That's what communion is about. Communion is all about remembering the ultimate victory. In fact, in Luke 22, where it says, Luke 22, verse 19, listen to what Jesus says. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering the ultimate victory in our life. And what it is, and we talk about many times, the, the, the bread and the cup are a picture of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's a reminder of what he gave for us, how we take it. In a little bit, we're going to uh, just have some, first of all, uh, Pastor Todd's going to lead us in a song with worship. And then, then I'll open up the table and, and we're going to have a, some special music by Jim. Uh, and, and that's the time to come forward and, and just take it. And you can take it back to your seat. You can take it up front with a prayer team. You can take it alone. You can take it with your family. You can take it with a friend. There's no right or wrong way. The idea is that we commune together with Jesus Christ. There's only two reasons why you shouldn't. One is if you're not a Christian yet. If you're not a Christian yet, then just wait. Uh, I hope you become a Christian today and take it. But if you're not ready, you're not at that place yet, it's okay. We don't videotape. We don't look down on anybody. You know, just, you know, just pray through this time. Wait for the next time. Or also the second reason why is if there's something in your life that you're not willing to surrender. There's a sin. There's, there's part of our life that we're not willing to surrender. Whatever that is, say, God, you can't have this. Don't take it. The Bible's very clear. Don't take it in an unworthy way. But I hope that you surrender it today. Not saying you have to have victory over it today, but surrender it. Say, God, whatever it takes, I give this to you. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to, whoever I have to talk to, whatever I have to do, whatever battle I've got to fight, I, I surrender this to you. I hope that you do that. Because I, I hope you do, because all can commune with God this morning. Do you want to be able to commune with God? Do you want to be able to commune with God? Do you want to receive his gift of life? Not just heaven someday, but here. It's life. Heaven is awesome. I can't wait. But there's life here. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you receive life at that second. And that life, that real life, that awesome life starts here and now with that surrender to Jesus Christ. Do you want to have that? You can have it by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace you are saved through faith. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Let's pray. Have you ever put your faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever been saved by his grace? Do you have life now and forever through his son, Jesus Christ? If, if you're not sure, you can be sure right now. Right where you are at this very moment, you can be sure by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. By putting your trust, your hope, giving your life to Jesus Christ. It's a simple prayer of faith to receive this gift. For it is by grace you are saved through faith. God, please forgive me I repent, I turn away from everything in my life that goes against your word and your purpose for my life. Please forgive me because I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ.
I believe your son Jesus died on the cross for me. I believe he rose from the dead for me. I put my faith in him. I surrender my life to Jesus. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, something amazing has happened. Something awesome has happened. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is now living inside of you, has entered you and transformed you into a brand new person. You will never be the same. You have been born again. But you've also been born to fight a battle, just like the baby iguanas we saw. You've been born to fight. And I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Maybe you have a friend or family member here. Maybe tell me on the way out or fill out the card or text or email. Let me know so that we can help you grow in your faith. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit speaking to us? Maybe you came in here pretty down. Maybe you're facing a giant in your life. Maybe you're struggling with accusations. And today is the day to commune with God, to remember the cross of Jesus Christ, to remember the blood and the power of Jesus Christ, and remember what God has done for us at salvation and all the things he's done in our life since that day of salvation, the way his mercy and grace has worked And by remembering that and by reconnecting through communion with God, we just keep on fighting, just like that little baby iguana. We just keep on fighting our way through. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would move and speak to us now in a powerful way in Jesus' name. Amen. A snake's eyes aren't very good, but they can detect movement. So if the hatchling keeps its nerve, it may just avoid detection. escape. <laughs>